All right, we're back. We're live on Instagram, we're live on YouTube, we're doing some similarity. We're in our last hour, um, yeah, more or less. Um, and so we're gonna have to uh, probably skip some problems here and there. I'm sorry if I don't get to your topic, it's tough. We could probably go six, seven hours and just, you know, geometry, it is what it is. Let's talk some similarities, some basics. Two figures are similar if a similarity transformation, i.e. a dilation plus a rigid motion maps one onto the other. Similar figures have equal angles. The ratio of corresponding sides of similar triangles are equal or corresponding sides are proportional. The ratios of relatively positioned sides are proportional or equal. And triangles can be proven similar by angle angle, side side side, and side angle side. But almost guaranteed it'll be angle angle. If you have a similarity proof, you have to prove this triangle is similar to that one, 95% of the time angle angle and probably that 5% is gonna show up tomorrow. It's just, it's hard to make a proof with the other two because then you gotta give numbers. You gotta give lengths and they hate that in proof. Anyway, let's do some similarity problems. We'll probably start to skip around a little bit now just to get to uh, a little bit of everything. But let's start with a very basic one. June 2015, number 11. In the diagram of triangle ADC below, EB is parallel to DC. So EB is parallel to DC, and then they give all these random lengths. And they ask, what is the length of AC to the nearest tenth? Well, okay, so here's the thing. Because you've got these two lines that are parallel, it automatically means that this triangle and then this triangle are similar to each other. And if that's the case in a problem like this, 100% of the time what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the two triangles separately. So maybe I'll kind of yeah, I'll do this. So I got triangle A, E, B with that 9 and that 9.2. And I've got then the larger triangle, which is A, D, C. That doesn't look like a D. A, D, C. And that length is 14. And this is what I'm looking for. I'll call it X, right? And now here's the beautiful thing. You can set up a ratio in many different ways. You could do like 9 divided by 14 is 9.2 divided by x. You could do 9 divided by 9.2 is 14 divided by x. That's that whole ratio of relatively positioned sides are equal. It's really all up to you, but it basically boils down to this, right? If I kind of give myself a little bit more room here, let me kind of go more classic. 9 divided by 14 is equal to 9.2 divided by x. If I then do a little bit of cross multiplying and I get 9x is equal to 14 times 9.2, whatever that's equal to. Did I actually write it down? I didn't, actually. Um, but then you just divide both sides by 9, right? You do all that arithmetic on your calculator, i.e. 14 times 9.2 divided by 9. You get x is equal to 14.311. So to the nearest tenth, we're talking about 14.3. So pretty easy. The key is to be able to visualize those two similar triangles so that you can set up the ratio appropriately. All right. I think we're going to actually skip over August 2015, head into January 2016. This is um, a fairly challenging problem because of how it's visually laid out. So let's take a look at this. 24 from January 2016. In triangle SCU shown below, points T and O are on SU and CU respectively. Segment OT is drawn so that angle C, and this is critical, is congruent to angle OTU up here. If TU is equal to 4, I'm going to just start to label some numbers, OU is equal to 5, and OC is equal to 7, what is the length of ST? All right. Now this is a particularly tricky problem because even though the big triangle and the small triangle are similar to each other, and by the way, the reason they're similar to each other is that they've got this angle equal to this angle, and then they share this angle, the problem is that smaller triangle is sort of not oriented in the same way as the larger triangle. This ain't parallel to this. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw the smaller triangle up here for a moment, but I'm going to kind of reflect it so that it's oriented in the same way as the larger triangle. So what does that mean exactly? It means that what I've really got is I'm going to put O up here, T down here, U is going to stay where it is, okay, like this. That means my 4, which is TU, is now down here. OU is 5, all right? And what I want is the length of ST. 
all right. Now, I can't really so much calculate ST directly, but what I can do is I can think of it like this, right? Right, I can think of SU, right? Here I've got 12, okay? Here I've got SU, maybe I'll call it X. So I might do something like this. I might say that X divided by five is equal to 12 divided by four, all right? So x divided by 5 is equal to the whole length 12 divided by this whole length 4. All right? I can easily solve this by multiplying by 5 on both sides. Of course, 12 divided by 4 is just equal to 3, so 3 times 5 gives me 15. Now that's the entire length. That's all of SU. All right, and one of the unfortunate things is that's one of the answers, right? That's choice four. And it's a little unfortunate because you've done beautiful work, you've actually done everything correct, and if you choose choice four, there's no getting around it. When it goes through that scantron, it's getting counted incorrectly because it's actually 11, right? We know this entire thing is 15, but we're only looking for the length of ST which is 11. It's those kind of things that is, are really unfortunate because it's all or nothing on a multiple choice question and you could have done a lot of the work right. All right, let's do a little similarity proof. This is a very, very easy one. You could face much harder ones, but given our time, let's do a simple similarity proof. June 2016. Given parallelogram A, B, C, D, great. I know I've got a parallelogram, love parallelograms. E, F, G, and diagonal D, F, B. Prove that triangle DEF is congruent, uh, sorry, is similar <laughs> to triangle BGF. All right, so let's kind of take a look. Um, by the way, if you're watching on, on uh, Instagram, I apologize. We've got kind of a pause going on due to a poor connection. Uh, I, you know, you might be able to hear me. I kind of doubt it. You might be able to see me. I really doubt that. If you can hear me, hopefully it's going to reconnect at some point. We're going to just, we're going to turn it off. And then we're going to turn Instagram back on to see if we can get it back. Um, you know, so hold with us if you're, uh, if you're watching on Instagram. But for YouTube Live, I'm going to keep going because we only have a certain amount of time left. Look, we are trying to get this triangle and this triangle similar to one another. And again, odds are I'm thinking angle, angle. Okay, but keep in mind that what we have is we've got a parallelogram. And because we've got a parallelogram, right, AB is going to be parallel to DC. And what that's going to allow me to do, actually, that's not the one I want, um, right? I know that this is parallel to this, right? BC is parallel to DE, which means these two angles, right? These two angles, it's still checking our connection. I'm not sure we're getting Instagram back. Sorry, Instagram folks. Um, you know, it could be just that our Wi-Fi is out because that's what Instagram is, is working with. But hey, who knows? I don't know. Anyway, we've got these two angles, though, that are congruent. Um, and, you know, so we got this angle and this angle that are congruent. And we can also say that these two angles are congruent because they're a vertical angle pair. So we've got these two congruent because opposite sides of a parallelogram are parallel. And these are alternate interior angles. Then these two are congruent because vertical angle pairs are always congruent. Therefore, we can say this triangle is similar to this triangle by angle angle. And again, I could write all of that out, but at the end of the day, first statement, ABCD is a parallelogram, given. Second statement, AD is parallel to BC because opposite sides of a parallelogram are parallel. Third statement, angle EDF is congruent to angle GBF. Uh, oh, it, it now is telling a start live video, although it gave us kind of something funny. It said uh, your connection's not good enough or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we don't want to have people inside reset the internet because then our cable goes. Of course, now I'm worried that we're not getting YouTube. Do you know if we're getting YouTube? Oh, yeah. yeah, we're getting YouTube. Ah, well. Sorry, Instagram. Hey, YouTube, let's do it. Um, anyway, connection issues, it is what it is. We're moving on. Uh, let's do a little bit on similarity related topics. That is kind of what it is. Um, one of the things that comes up in terms of similarity are what are called right triangle altitude problems. Some people call them mean proportion problems. And there's all these kind of theorems that you memorize. They have weird acronyms like, I don't even know what they are. I, honestly, I, I don't know what those acronyms are because when I see a problem like January 2018, right, number 23, 
um, where it says in the diagram below of triangle ABC, angle ABC is a right angle, AC is 12, AD is 8, and altitude BD is drawn, what always happens in these problems is that we get the, this one large right triangle and two smaller ones. Are, are we not on YouTube? Am I just talking to thin air? Okay, so you're getting it, you're watching it. Okay, great. Sorry, YouTube. Sorry. Um, our Wi-Fi is being problematic. That's how we're actually streaming Instagram. But thankfully, we have an Ethernet cable that's allowing us to do the YouTube live a little bit better. So Wi-Fi stinks. But uh, there I am, excellent, okay. So anyway, back to this problem. The plain fact is when we have a right triangle and we draw the altitude from the right angle to the hypotenuse forming three right triangles, one, two, and the big guy, all three of these triangles are similar to one another. They're all similar by angle, angle, and we could prove that. Ultimately speaking, there are all these theorems, you know, like this is the, uh, the geometric mean of this segment and this segment. Uh, the altitude is the geometric mean of this segment and this segment. This one is the geometric mean of this one and this one. And you can kind of memorize all that stuff. In this particular problem for me, it says, what's the length of BC? I want to know this length. Okay, obviously I can figure out that this length is four. And then to figure out this length, what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw triangle BCD. I'm going to draw it over here so that it's sort of oriented in the same direction. Okay, so I'm rewriting BCD. D is the right angle. All right, B is down here, C is up here. I know CD is equal to four. I'm looking for BC, so I'm gonna call that X. I'm gonna call it X over here as well because it's the same BC. And now the plain fact is this larger triangle and this smaller triangle are similar to each other. I can say X divided by four is equal to 12 divided by X. So this length divided by this length is equal to this length divided by this length. Well, let's do that. Let's do x divided by 4 is equal to 12 divided by x. And these are a few of the very few problems in common core geometry that actually end up giving you a quadratic. In this case, we get x squared is equal to 48. We can then solve this equation by taking the square root of both sides. We then have to use that simplest radical form work that we did in algebra 1 to re-express that as 4 root 3. I know there's a lot of people that want me to probably do like five or six of these problems. The plain fact is there could be a part one, then there could be a free response. Most likely there's going to either be a part one or a free response on these. And at the end of the day, right, the real key is not, you know, memorizing this is the mean proportion of this and this or this, the mean proportion of this and this or this, the mean proportion of this and this. Ultimately, for me, it's all about knowing that this triangle is similar to this one, redrawing the smaller triangle in a way that I can see the similarity, set up the proportion, and move on. All right, I think we're going to, yeah, I think we'll skip proportioning a line segment. You guys are pretty good at that. Let's do a little bit of trick. Actually, I say you're pretty good at it. I don't know. They're pretty easy problems. Let's do some trig, all right? Sokotoa. The trig ratios directly come from the idea of similarity. Any two right triangles that have acute angles that are equal are similar. So the ratios of their relatively positioned sides are equal. And it happens to be that when we look at the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse, we call that the sine. The adjacent side to the hypotenuse, the cosine, and the tangent is the opposite divided by adjacent. Now, one thing that's extremely important, tomorrow before the exam, teachers will swarm around the room and they will make you, or they'll do it themselves, reset the memory on your calculators. When that happens, at least with the Texas Instruments calculators, they go back into what's called radian mode. Now, yeah, you learned a little bit about radians in this course, but you definitely want your calculator set to degree mode, degree mode, degree mode, degree mode. Otherwise, all these trig problems, you're going to get wrong, okay? So let's jump in to June of 2015, okay? Number five, as shown in the diagram below, the angle of elevation um, from a point on the ground to the top of a tree is 34 degrees. If the point is 20 feet from the base of the tree, let me kind of just draw that in, that's my 20, all right? The height of the tree to the nearest foot is what? 
Let me just kind of redraw this picture really quick so that it's kind of, you know, I don't have trees sitting there. Let me put a little H here for height. Let me put it 20 there. Let me put the 34 degrees here, and then it's all about Sokotoa. Okay, so what we do is we want to identify the correct ratio. We know that the H is opposite that angle, and we know that the 20 is adjacent to that angle. So we know that that must mean that we're working with the tangent ratio. Specifically, we can write the equation, the tangent of 34 degrees is the side opposite, which is what we're looking for, divided by the side adjacent, which is what we know. We can now solve for the height by just multiplying both sides of this equation by 20. And now this is just all about your calculator. The plain fact is, and I can't do this in my head, nobody can do this in my head, your head, you take out your calculator, you type in 20 times the tangent of 34, as long as your calculator is in degree mode, not radian mode, then you're going to get 13.490, etc which to the nearest tenth of a foot is choice three, 13.5. Hopefully, if your calculator is in radian mode, you'd get some very silly looking, some very silly looking answer. I can't even find the answer. Some very silly looking answer here, okay? And hopefully you'd go, oh, that's weird. Hmm, look at my mode. Oh, I'm in radians, I need to be in degrees, okay? So be careful about that. You don't need to be in radian mode for any part of this test. January 2016. Number nine, we don't even need to go to the board for this one. It's, it's that easy. In triangle ABC, the complement of B is A. Which statement is always true? So there's this little thing in right triangle trig that they want you to know. And they test it on like three out of every four regents geometry tests. And that's the following. When two angles are complements, it means they add up to 90, okay? When two angles are complements, the sine of one is the cosine of the other. And this is very simple. Let me like illustrate with a very, very easy picture, okay? The reason for this is simple. If I have something like this, this triangle, A, B, C, right, where C is the right angle, let's say it's a classic three, four, five right triangle. Yeah, classic three, four, five. Let me, A and B are complements of each other. The two acute angles in a right triangle are complements, okay? So if A and B are complements, then just take a look at this. The sine of A, which is opposite divided by hypotenuse, right, is the same as the cosine of B, right? That's the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. So when, oh, Instagram's back, hey, we, we, uh, we lost Wi-Fi. I don't know what happened. It was probably the storms. It may have been the storms. All we know is Wi-Fi got knocked out. YouTube kept going. We did like five or six more slides. I'm just kidding. You should really watch on YouTube. It's, it's much more reliable. Anyway, we're talking about this problem where we're, we're saying we've got two, two angles in a right triangle that are complements to each other. What is the relationship? That's right. The sine of A is the cosine of B. Any time the two angles add up to 90, the sine of one is equal to the cosine of the other. Forget about tangent, right? It's just, just not there. Okay, let's do another right triangle trig problem. Now, in right triangle trig problems, in very practical sense, right, you're only going to ever do one of two things. You're either going to find a missing side of the right triangle, or you're going to find a missing angle of the right triangle. We already did one, the first problem with the tree and the angle of elevation, where we found a missing side, the height. In this case, we're going to find the angle, okay? Very, very easy. Uh, in the diagram, blah de blah de blah, right? It says AB is 14 and AC is 9. What is the measure of angle A to the nearest degree? Right triangle trig is all about the angle, all about the angle, all about the angle, all about the angle. So I look at angle A, I don't care about B or C, and I notice that what I have is I have the side that's adjacent to the angle, and of course I've got the hypotenuse. Adjacent and hypotenuse is cosine. So I'm going to say the cosine of angle A is the side adjacent, which is 9, divided by the hypotenuse, 14. Now the last thing I'd want to do right now is take my calculator and go, what is the cosine of 9 fourteenths? No, the thing inside of the cosine is an angle. If I know the cosine and I want the angle, that's when I use what's called the inverse cosine, or second cosine, right? So in terms of mathematical notation, it's a cosine with a little negative 1 as its exponent, and I do cosine negative 1, 9 fourteenths. Again, I can't do that in my head, uh, but 
If I just punch it into my calculator, it gives me like 49.99, etc. for a nice answer of 50 degrees, right? So identify the ratio, set it up. If you're solving for the angle, use the inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent, whichever one you need. All right, let's take a look at one last one. Okay, um, you can have free response problems, oftentimes four point problems, where you have to do multiple trig ratios in order to get the right answer. So let's take a look at August 2015, problem number 32. As shown in the diagram below, a ship is heading directly towards the lighthouse whose beacon is 125 feet above sea level. At the first sighting, point A, the angle of elevation from the ship to the light was 70 degrees, 7 degrees, sorry. A short time later at point D, the angle of elevation was 16 degrees. To the nearest foot, determine and state how far the ship traveled from point A to point D. So let's be very clear. What I want is the distance from here to here, okay? But that distance is not part of a right triangle, all right? Still, what I can do is I can work with two right triangles. I can work with this one, all right? And I can figure out this distance. Let me call it x. Now, specifically, think about this for a minute. I've got x, I've got 125, and I've got the 7 degrees. The 125 is opposite of x, I'm sorry, opposite of 7, and the x is adjacent to 7. So I can say that the tangent of 7 degrees is equal to 125 divided by x. Now in this case, the variable that I'm solving for is in the denominator. So ultimately, I would multiply both sides by x, and then I would divide both sides by the tangent of 7 degrees. All right, so x is equal to 125 divided by the tangent of 7 degrees, which ends up being a messy number uh, 1018.043. That's good enough. All right, so great. What does that tell me? That tells me, oh, all the way from here to here, right, is 1018.043. I'm now gonna do exactly the same with this smaller right triangle. Don't use x. It's the same problem, use a different variable. I'm gonna call this y. I'm gonna say the tangent now, same, same trig ratio, tangent of 16 degrees is 125 divided by y. I could do the same thing. Y will end up being 125 divided by tangent of 16 degrees, which when I evaluate that on my calculator gives me 435.9268, etc. Sorry about that moving a little bit on us. All right. And now, of course, in order to get the distance I want, AD, right, I would take this long distance, 1018.043. I'd subtract off the shorter distance, 435.928. That would leave me with what I want. So I would do this minus this. And let me just write down the final answer. It ends up being like 582.11, et cetera. But they want it to the nearest foot, so 582 feet. All right, and again, I apologize. I'm moving now. I'm moving, I'm moving fast through stuff because we don't have a lot of time left. Um, right triangle trig basically boils down to that though. It's not that, that bad at the end of the day. All right, sometimes these problems can get a lot worse. I'm gonna cross my fingers that you get an easy one like this tomorrow, uh, cause that's not too bad. Let's move on though from right triangle trig. Circles and circle theorems. All right, let's really quickly go through circle theorems. Okay, so circle angle theorems. Um, whenever you have an angle that has its vertex on the circle and then the rays intersect the circle, that's called an inscribed angle that's gonna come up in the first problem. And an inscribed angle is always one half the measure of the intercepted arc. One half the measure of the intercepted arc. We can also though have two what are called chords intersect within a circle. Now if two chords intersect within a circle, then the measure of the angle that they make, let's say AEB, is going to be that arc plus that arc divided by two. You could say it's the average of the two intercepted arcs. And finally, if we have what are called two secants that intersect a circle from a point outside the circle, then that angle will simply be that arc minus this arc divided by two. Larger arc minus smaller arc divided by two. Those are the basic angle theorems that you need to know about circles. There's a lot more you need to know, but those are the basic ones. And then real big one here, 
Anytime you have a tangent, a tangent is a line that just touches a circle at one point, okay? Any tangent is perpendicular to the radius at the point of tangency. Really key. That can come up in all sorts of problems, trig, uh, Pythagorean theorem, etc. Now you've also got some theorems that relate segment lengths. Come on. There we go. So let's say that we had two segments, two chords that intersect within a circle. Then the product of the partitions are equal. So if I take that times that and then move the circle sum, if I take DE times CE, I'm going to get AE times EB. The product of the two partitioned segments is equal. Now, on the other hand, if I've got these two secants, kind of like I did up in the above picture with the angles, now what happens is if I take the segment that's outside the circle and multiply it by the entire segment length, so EA times EB is equal to EC times ED, that product is always constant. So much to memorize. You know, and we could prove these theorems, but you really got to have them memorized. There's just no getting around that. Um, so let's, let's jump into a problem. January 2016, number 21. In the diagram below, oh boy, there's lots of stuff, right? Um, they also say FDE is tangent at point D, radius AO is drawn. Sam decides to apply this theorem to the diagram. An angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. Which angle is Sam referring to? It feels like it's like a Jeopardy question or something weird like that. But then again, everything sounds like Jeopardy at this point. An angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. It's actually a famous angle theorem from this work. Well, first off, we have to be talking about an angle that's inscribed. So it's got to be an angle that has its vertex on the circle itself. So AOB, well, the problem with AOB as an angle is it's this angle. That's not even an inscribed angle. That's what's called a central angle. And just as an aside, the measure of a central angle is always equal to the measure of the arc that it intercepts. It's actually by definition, that's, that, that's what the arc is, is it's the measure of that central angle. But that's not a, that's simply not an inscribed angle. So I'm going I'm to get rid of that. Okay, angle BAC. Well, BAC, at least that one, angle BAC is an inscribed angle, right? But it's not inscribed in a semicircle because CB is not a diameter, okay? Plus, it sure doesn't look like a right angle. Um, DCB, DCB, that would be this angle. Ah, again, it's an inscribed angle because C lies on the circle. Now, because O is a center, db is a diameter and therefore this is an angle inscribed in a semicircle and it must be a right angle by the way the reason it has to be a right angle is the fact that the arc that this angle intercepts which is db since db is a diameter right then this arc must measure 180 degrees Inscribed angles are always half of the intercepted arc, so since the arc it intercepts is 180, right, it's half the circle, then half of that is 90 degrees. Anyway, so the correct answer is DCB. All right, June 2016, number 10. In the diagram below of circle O, OB and OC are radii, and chords AB, BC, and AC are drawn. Which statement must always be true? BAC is congruent to BOC. So BAC is congruent to BOC? Now, that would mean that they have the same measure. And that, 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 that's like obtuse, that's acute, no. How about measure of angle BAC is one half of measure of angle BOC? Well, that actually is true, all right? Now, normally kids think of it as, well, BAC is half of the measure of arc BC. Very true. But the measure of arc BC is the measure of angle BOC, and therefore the measure of angle BAC is one half the measure of angle BOC. Okay, anyway, simple enough. Ooh, let's get into a free response problem. January 2017, number 28. In the diagram below, tangent DA and secant DBC are drawn to circle O from external point D, such that arc AC is congruent to arc BC. If the measure of arc BC is 152 degrees, let me draw that on the diagram. All right, determine and state the measure of angle D. All right, well, we've got this theorem. 
Okay? And the theorem says that if we have an exterior point and we draw lines that intersect the circle, whether they're two secants or two tangents or a tangent and a secant, then the theorem says that the measure of that exterior angle will be this arc minus this arc divided by two. So in other words, I can say that the measure of angle D is equal to the measure of AC, which is this, minus the measure of AB, which is this, all right, all divided by two. Okay. Well, that means I gotta have those two arcs, so there's no way I'm gonna be able to figure out what D is. The plain fact though is they told me that AC and BC are congruent to each other. So if BC is 152, AC is 152. That's easy enough. But I still need AB. That is also easy enough because all three arcs in this problem, AB, BC, and AC must add to 360 degrees. So I can just take that 152 and add another 152 and I can get 304 degrees. I can then do 360 minus 304 and that gives me 56 degrees. That's got to be the measure of arc AB. But now I can use the theorem, right? I know AC, it's 50, 152. I know AB, it's 56, this is plug and chug at this point, so I would just have 152 minus 56, hey red, divided by 2, and again that is what it is, what it is, um, that ends up being 48 degrees. All right, now those, there are so many other circle problems. We just like barely scratched the surface of the theorems that, are, that cover circles. One thing that's a guarantee, though, in terms of the geometry exam, is that you are pretty much guaranteed to have to deal with equations of circles, especially in their center radius form. x minus the coordinate of the center of the circle squared plus y minus the coordinate of the center of the circle squared equals the radius squared. This is actually just the Pythagorean theorem. Something squared plus something squared equals something squared. All right, but almost 100% of the time, when you have one of these problems in the Common Core Geometry Exam, really what it is, is it's not particularly a geometry problem, it's an algebra problem. What they want you to do is use the process of completing the square to take an equation of a circle that kind of looks like this in August 2015 and change it into something like this so you can either identify the center or the radius, or as we'll see in a moment, both. Anyway, let's jump in and do August 2015 really quick. Oh boy. There we go. Okay, August 2015, number nine. If x squared plus 4x plus y squared minus 6y minus 12 is the equation of a circle, the length of the radius is what? All right, so this is just a completing the square problem. Now, one thing I'm gonna do right away is I'm gonna take that negative 12 that's on the left-hand side and I'm gonna put it on the right-hand side where it shall become a positive 12. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna complete the square twice, once to this, now remember how to complete the square. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that 4 that's attached to the x, I'm going to divide it by 2, and then I'm going to square that 2, which unfortunately gives me a 4 again. And I'm going to add a 4. Now what I do to the left-hand side, i got to do to the right-hand side. So since I added 4 to the left-hand side, I'm going to add it to the right-hand side. The y squared minus 6y, again, I'm going to take a negative 6. I'm going to divide it by 2. I'm going to get negative 3. I'm going to take negative 3. I'm going to square it. I'm going to get positive 9. So I'm going to get y squared minus 6y plus 9 and plus 9. Now just break out just for a second here. Um, I could then take these two things and factor them and all that, and that would help me find the center of the circle. I'm going to do that even though it has nothing to do with the problem. Ultimately speaking, it's all about the numbers over here, okay? But still, I can factor this, and the idea is it would factor as x plus 2 squared plus y minus 3 squared is equal to 1625. Now, although they never asked in this problem what it was, I can now identify the center of the circle. Most students will just say, hey, it's the opposite of what I see. Fair enough, you got a test tomorrow. So the center of the circle is negative two, positive three, which is not in this problem. And this number here is the square of the radius. This thing is r squared. So the radius will always be the square root of that number. Sometimes it's nice, sometimes it's not nice. In this case it is, and it's five. Be careful, and sometimes in these problems they can be real jerks and they can give you a problem like this and be like, which of the following is the diameter? 
in which case you figure out the radius, 5, and you double it and you get the diameter. Hopefully they don't do that because that's kind of a jerky thing to do. But hey, you know, it's math. Okay, June of 2015. Here, we've got the equation of a circle, x squared plus y squared plus 6y equals 7. What are the coordinates of the center and the length of the radius of the circle? Now, normally I wouldn't waste my time by doing exactly another one of these, but this one can seem a little tricky given the fact that there isn't anything you have to do to the x. The x is just sort of what it is. You still need to complete the square, though, on the y term. Dividing 6 by 2 gives me 3, squaring it gives me 9. Don't forget to add the 9 to the other side. Again, nothing I'm going to do to that x, but then I'm going to get y plus 3 quantity squared equals 16. So right away, the easy part might be to look at the 16 and go, well, the radius has to be the square root of that, so the radius is 4. In which case, right, my answer is either 1 or it's 2. Okay, here's the key, right? Really, this x squared can be thought of as, if you will, x minus 0 squared. I'm not going to rewrite that down just to change, save time, but that means that the, the center, right, is at 0, negative 3. Remember, it's always the opposite. If it's y plus 3, then the center is at negative 3. So our correct answer, choice 2, the center is at 0, negative 3, with a radius of 4. All right, I know people get very concerned about these. Sector areas, arc lengths, and radians, they're, they're important right? So let, let's take a look about sectors. Now just as a side, what, what is a sector, right? A sector basically is when you take a circle and you cut out a slice of pizza, right? That's a sector, okay? And everything about sectors is what I call proportional reasoning, okay? It's all about how much of the overall circle you've kind of sliced out right there. And this problem is a case in point in that. June 2016, all right? What is the area of a sector of a circle with a radius of eight inches and formed by a central angle that measures 60 degrees? All right, so in other words, I've got this circle, okay? I know that its radius is eight inches and the central angle is 60 degrees and I want to know what the area of that is equal to. All right. These problems are a piece of cake, and here's why. Every time, what I want you to do is I want you to say, well, let me figure out the area of the total circle. That's going to be pi r squared, as you've, you know, as you've known for years. So that's going to be pi times 8 squared, and that's going to be 64 pi. That's the area of the entire circle with a little red thrown in just for pizzazz. So the area of the entire circle is 64 pi. I want to know the area of that slice of the circle. Well, it's very simple. I can do just some proportional reasoning. I can say the area of the sector divided by the area total is equal to the central angle of the sector, which is 60 degrees, divided by the total, 360 degrees. That just gives me this equation. The area of the sector, which is what I'm looking for, divided by 64 pi is equal to 60 divided by 360. And now I just have to solve that. Now, what would make your life a lot easier is if you recognize that 60 divided by 360 is 1 sixth, right? All I've got is a sixth of a circle. I got 60 out of 360. That's the same as 6 out of 36. That's the same as 1 out of 6. It's really helpful to be able to do this because then you can multiply both sides by 64 pi, cancel, and you can reduce. You can divide that by 2. You can divide this by 2, and you get 32 pi over 3. Choice 3. That's that. That's it. You know? It's proportional reasoning. That's all it is. It's all about what fraction of the circle, what proportion of the circle the sector represents, and that's always given by the central angle. Now, they can do a little twist in this type of problem. Take a look at June 2015, number 29. In the diagram below of circle O, the area of the shaded sector is 12 pi square inches. And the length of OA is 6 inches. Determine and state the measure of AOC. So it's almost kind of the opposite problem of what we just did, right? We know what the area of the shaded sector is. We're looking for the central angle. Last time, we knew what the central angle was, and we were looking for the area of the shaded region. But yet, we're going to do it the same way. Here, first, let me figure out what the total area of the circle is. Pi r squared. Pi times 6 squared 
gives me 36 pi. That's the area of the entire circle. That's everything, right? So then if I say the area of the sector divided by the area total is equal to the angle, which is x divided by 360, well, let's see, the area of the sector they told me was 12 pi. The area of the total circle is 36 pi. That's x divided by 360. And again, it's just about solving this proportion, which can seem really ugly and terrible because of the, you know, the pies and all that. But okay, look, pi divided by pi is one, so that's taken care of. And 12 goes into 36 three times. So it's critical to know you've just got one third of the circle. That's it. 12 pi out of 36 pi is one third of the circle. And so therefore, x must be one third of the 360. So the central angle is 120 degrees. That's it, all right? Now, along this line is a much larger topic of radians. Radians are simply a whole nother way of measuring rotations. But for this exam, you need to know one thing, which is that about radians. You need to know a lot of things. Let's face it, I think we've already listed about, I don't know, something like 57 things you need to know. It's probably way more than that. But undoubtedly, the thing you need to know about radians is that if you're measuring an angle in radians, which is oftentimes you use the Greek letter theta, then you always divide the arc length that you intercept, oftentimes that's the letter, for some reason we use the letter S, divided by the radius of the circle. Whoa. Divided by the radius of the circle. Radians equals arc length divided by radius. See how neat and obvious that is? Anyway, so in this particular problem, we've got these two circles. This one's got a radius of four and an arc length of pi. This one's got a radius of six point pi and a very ugly arc length of 13 pi divided by eight. And it says, Dominic thinks that angles A and B have the same radian measure, which would also mean they have the same degree measure, by the by. State whether Dominic is correct or not. Well, here's the deal. I would definitely just do this with my calculator, and here's what I mean. Okay, the measure of angle A in terms of radians is its arc length, which is pi, divided by its radius, which is four. And again, I would take my calculator out. I would just plug these numbers in. I wouldn't do anything more than that. And I'm gonna get this messy decimal, 0.78539, etc. Now, theta b is gonna be its arc length, 13 pi divided by eight, all divided by 6.5. Now, don't get me wrong, all by itself, just kind of getting this thing chucked into your calculator is gonna be tough. But if you kind of get that all cranked through, and you see what the decimal is, you'd get 0.78539, etc. All right, now one of the things that's a little bit unfortunate about this problem is it's not a justify, it's an explain, right? So we gotta use some words, but we don't have to use very many words. We're just gonna say yes, because the ratios of arc length to radii are equal. I mean, that's just the definition of radian measure. Are the two radian angles equal? Yes, because the ratios of the arc lengths to the radii are equal to each other. All right. Now, don't get me wrong, if you set this up and this up, and let's say you botched this, so you got something weird, 0.5732, I don't know what it is. Then, of course, you would say no, because the ratios of arc lengths to radii are not equal, and you would get basically all credit, you would lose one point, because this all by itself is demonstrating that you know what radians are, right? The ratio or the division of arc length to radius. And then if they're not the same, then you should conclude no right? Dominic isn't always right. Most of the time. Most of the time. Wow, we're almost done, folks. Yeah, that's right. Constructs, constructions, what, Joel function. We got 20 minutes. Okay. So you're supposed to know all these constructions. 10 of them. You're supposed to know 10 constructions. Copying a segment, copying an angle, copying a triangle, bisecting an angle, bisecting a segment. Really important. The perpendicular bisector. Perpendicular line through a point on a line to a line. Perpendicular 
through a point not on a line to a line. A line parallel through a point. A square, a hexagon, an equilateral triangle in a circle. There's a lot. All right. I could spend the last 20 minutes just doing the constructions that we have. I'm probably going to like freehand them, which you should never ever do. Okay. But I'm going to freehand them just to save us some time because my awkwardness with uh, rulers and protractors on this board is legendary. Legendary. Anyway, let's just talk a little bit about this. Um, June 2015. Use a compass and a straight edge to construct an inscribed square in circle T shown below. Leave all construction marks. I've seen this one actually come up twice on the Regents exam. I am going to drag this down. Here's how I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to actually just draw a diameter on this, on this circle. I'm going to mark its endpoints. Then, and here's where I'm going to just kind of do some hand waving. I would then do is I would do the perpendicular bisector of this segment. Perpendicular bisectors are amazingly important. The way that you do them is you take your compass, you, know, you set it to some radius, and you put the spiky end at one point. You kind of draw an arc up here, you draw an arc down here. Then you leave the same length, you put it over here, you draw an arc up here, you draw an arc down there. Horrible, but you get the idea, right? All right, when you then draw the line through the X, and it really should have gone through the X down here as well, <laughs> now it did. Right? When you do that, you get the perpendicular bisector of this segment. But the great thing is in terms of this construction, when you then take your straight edge, don't do it by hand, you'll just lose all the points automatically. But when you then take your straight edge and you draw on the sides, you have your square. It's kind of cool. Okay? Let's do another hand-waving construction so we can take a shot at getting to the last slide. Yeah. Ah. June 2016. <laughs> Did you like how I breezed past the last? It was copying a triangle. Those are easy. June 2016, number 31. In the diagram below, radius OA is drawn in circle O. Using a compass and a straight edge, construct a line tangent to circle O at point A. Leave all construction marks. Always leave all construction marks. Always do all of your constructions in pencil, etc. Now, this one wants us to construct a tangent line to circle O at point A. And the key to this, the key to doing this construction correctly is knowing that when you have a radius and you have a tangent line, they are perpendicular to each other. So really what this construction is asking you to do is a classic one, which is to draw a line that is perpendicular to a point that is on another line. So the way that we would do this construction, and again, I'm going to do a little bit of hand waving just to make it faster, is the first thing I would do is I would extend, ah, man, really? Really? You're just, you're supposed to actually draw right along that. That still didn't work. Anyway, sometimes my ruler works, sometimes my ruler does not work. I don't know why. It's not working this time. Anyway, I'm going to just extend this. It's supposed to work like a ruler. Okay, anyway, I extended that. Now, what I do is I take my compass out and I set it to basically any radius I want. I put the sharp end at A and I make some arcs. Now, the reason that I do that is that these two points here and here are now equidistant from point A. A is the midpoint of these two marks, okay? And now what I do is going back to the first construction I did, I now create the perpendicular bisector of that segment between those two. And again, I do that by taking my compass out, setting it to a certain length, putting the pointy end here, making an arc mark here and an arc mark down here. Sounds like aardvark. I love it. Anyway, using the same length, we come over to this point. We do the, 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 the pointy end again, right? And we draw that line through the X's. Now what that guarantees is that this then becomes the perpendicular bisector of this, meaning it's perpendicular and it goes through A, which means it's a tangent. That's it. And I think, oh no, we got one more. Ooh, it's a dilation one, right? A construction involving a dilation. It's really, really simple. Um, it says, using a compass and straight edge, construct and label triangle A prime, B prime, C prime, the image of triangle ABC after a dilation of a scale factor of two centered at point B. All right, so let's do it. Um, the way that we would do this is we would take our, our, our ruler out, all right, we would make it go through point B and C, and we would hope that it, now it works, okay, 
Then I'm gonna do the same thing. <laughs> you never know. That time it didn't work, I'll be darned. All right, well, whatever. Okay, anyway, so, so then what we do is we take our compass out and we just wanna make sure that the image of C prime is twice as far from D. So I take my compass out and I set it to that length, right? And I come over here and I put it at C and I make this mark and I make this mark, okay? Then I come here and I set my compass to be this length. And I make this mark and I make this mark. By the way, why do you have to make this mark? To prove that you measured BA. Why do I make this mark? To prove I measured BC. This then becomes A prime. This becomes C prime. I then use my ruler to draw it in. And that would be the dilated segment AC. One of the things that's kind of cool is you can even see, I did an okay job kind of hand sketching it, AC is parallel, sorry, A prime C prime is parallel to AC. Constructions. I know, I know there's lots of you that wanted me to do every construction in the book. Um, I will say, just as an aside, you know, at emathinstruction.com, for free, if you go into our geometry course, there is a unit on constructions. Uh, every single construction, every classic construction is there. There are a few of them in the circle chapter, but mostly they're in our unit on constructions. I think it's unit four. I think it's unit four. You'd, you'd think I know that. I wrote the book. All right. Ah, oh, last slide. Area, volume, and density. We got 12 minutes left. Look, don't forget, you got formulas. Okay, there's formulas in the back of the sheet, right? And you got all these different types of three-dimensional figures you have to know about, general prisms. Prisms are figures that have the same top and bottom, but then their sides are parallelograms. Cylinders, kind of like prisms, they have tops and bottoms that are circles and then some height, right? A sphere, you know what a sphere is. A cone, I think you know what a cone is. And a pyramid is like a cone, except it's got a base that's something, a square, a rectangle, something, and then there's a pointy and you, you go up. Oh, isn't that a great, those great definitions? One thing that's really important about this formula sheet is when you see a capital B, it's not a length, it's an area. So the generalized volume formula for a prism isn't like base times height, it's base area times height. Likewise, when you, when you get something like this, the volume of a pyramid is one-third the base area times the height. But remember, the formulas are there. You just gotta take numbers and plug them in, and then be very careful on your calculator. Let's do a few. We might get through these. I doubt it. Anyway, January 2016, number seven. As shown in the diagram below, a regular pyramid has a square base whose side measures six inches. If the altitude of the perimeter measures 12 inches, its volume in cubic inches is what? Well, the first thing I do is I just make sure I've got this formula written down. Volume equals one-third B times H, where B is the base area. Simple enough, right? The base here is a square, all right? So the base area is gonna be six times six, or 36 square inches. I don't even need to put the square inches down, but whatever, it's there, all right? The height, well, that's this thing. The altitude is the height of something. So this thing is 12 inches. I'm not talking about that diagonal length. I'm actually talking about like, if I measured from here down to here, that's 12 inches. So it's plug and chug, here we go. The volume is one third times the base area times the height. All right, you can just plug this into your calculator or you can also do this and I'll get 144 cubic inches. I just want to make sure that's right because it feels wrong. You know, sometimes things just feel wrong, but that's right. All right, let's do one that's way more messy, okay? Now, that one's just straightforward. Take the formula, plug it in, right? But we get a lot of problems like this where we have some kind of larger volume and we've removed something from it a subtractive process. January 2017, number 11. A solid metal prism has a rectangular base with sides of four inches and six inches and a height of four inches. 
A hole in the shape of a cylinder with a radius of one inch is drilled through the entire length of the rectangular prism. What is the approximate volume of the remaining solid in cubic inches? Okay, well first, let's just calculate, very easy, the volume of the solid that was there to begin with, all right? That's just a rectangular solid, also known as a rectangular prism. It's gonna be four times four times six. So the volume sort of total, if you will, four times four times six, is going to be, uh, is that 98? Let's see, 24, 96. 96 cubic inches. I like to have the, I like to have the inches there, right? Okay, there we go. Now, what I'm gonna have to do now is I'm gonna have to subtract off the volume that I remove, and this is gonna get a little bit more ugly because I'm removing the volume of a cylinder. So I, I, you know, I end up going back to my formula sheet and I find that the volume of a cylinder is pi times the radius squared times the height. Now, the radius of this cylinder is simply one inch, but the height is this six inches. It's kind of tricky because I can't see it, but the cylinder is kind of like, it's been cut out like this, right? So the volume there is gonna be pi times one squared times six. Now you could certainly work this all out or you could just leave it as six times pi, but you could also work out the, the, the decimal version of that, which I didn't do. All right, at the end of the day, what you're gonna do though is you're gonna do 96 minus that six pi. All right, this is actually a free, res free response problem, sorry. So 96, no it's not, it's a multiple choice. Anyway, 96 minus six pi, I do that on my calculator. I find 77.150, so choice two. 77. It's a subtractive volume problem. I have some large volume to begin with, very easy because it's just the volume of a box, length times width times height. Then I have to subtract off the volume of the cylinder. This is where it gets tricky because you got a square radius. In this case, squaring one is just one times one, which is one times six, six times pi, which is roughly then three, so you get 18. Anyway, whatever, let's move on. All right, <laughs> that's right, we're running out of time. <laughs> January 2018, this is gonna be an additive volume problem because we've got a cylinder and we've got a hemisphere sitting on top of it and we wanna add their volumes together. That's the long and short of it, but let's take a look at it. Number 33, a storage tank is in the shape of a cylinder with a hemisphere on top. The highest point inside the storage tank is 13 meters above the floor of the storage tank and the diameter inside the cylinder is eight meters. Determine and state to the nearest cubic meter the total volume inside the storage tank. Okay, easy enough, here we go, right? Because we've got a cylinder and we've got a hemisphere, let's deal with the cylinder first. The volume of a cylinder, as we just saw, is pi times r squared times h. Well, do I know those two things? Well, I do know that the radius is four, fine. But what's the height? They've actually made that just a little tricky, except this is a hemisphere. And a hemisphere is half of a sphere. So since I know that this is four, I also know this is four. And since I know that's four and this is 13, I can now say that's nine. So I now know the radius of the cylinder, which is four, and I know the height, which is nine. So the volume of the cylinder is gonna be pi times four squared times nine. And this time I actually would kind of work it out. It's, you know, again, it's ugly because of the, the pi and whatnot, but the volume of the cylinder ends up being 452.389. All right, now the volume of the hemisphere is a little bit more obnoxious because the volume of a sphere all by itself ain't pretty. It's four thirds times pi r squared, and then I gotta take half of it. But then again, I think we can all hit divided by two on our calculator right? That's not so bad. So at the end of the day, for the volume of the hemisphere, right, it's going to be one half times four thirds pi r cubed, right, um, which is going to be one half times four thirds times pi times four cubed. And, you know, I'm kind of brushing it off a little bit. Um, a lot of students can get to this point and they just can't, they can't get through this. You know, and I don't know what to tell you because that's just basic calculator stuff. You gotta be able to take your calculator and type in the fraction four thirds, then type in times pi, then type in times four carat to the third, 
Maybe you get a number and then you divide it by two or multiply it by one half, but one way or another, you gotta be able to get through that and you get something like 33 point, whoops, five, one, zero. That's supposed to be a five. It doesn't look like a five, but it's supposed to be a five. Five, one, zero. Then of course, because all I'm looking to do is find the total volume of this, I simply take this volume, I add to this volume, and I get the total volume, which is like, uh, duh, yeah, 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 486 cubic meters. All right, so this plus this gives us this. You can kind of see how that works out. All right, not too bad, but again, basic calculator work. Please, 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 write the formulas down. Write them down. You might even get some credit for that. And it's much, much more likely that you'll then substitute into the formula correctly rather than make some kind of silly mistake. All right, let's talk about density really quick. Density is simple enough. It's how much of whatever, weight, mass, people, bacteria, calories, I don't care, how much of whatever it's sitting inside of whatever. When I tell you that a dozen eggs is 12 eggs per dozen, that's a density. 12 eggs per dozen. 15 people per square meter. That would, that would be really cramped, by the way. But, but those things are densities, and you get very kind of easy density. This is so great, this is green. So on the green screen, it's doing a crazy thing. I'm just gonna get rid of that, I shouldn't. Wow, that is, that, that's so awesome, Joey. I gotta remember, don't use green in presentations. Delete, okay. A shipping container is in the shape of a right rectangular prism with a length of 12 feet, a width of 8.5 feet, and a height of four feet. So it's a box. It's a box that's 12 feet by 8.5 feet by four feet, whatever. It's a box, okay? The container is completely filled with contents that way on our average 0.25 pounds per cubic foot. Every cubic foot is gonna give us another 0.25 pounds. That is a density. Technically, it's what's called a weight density or a force density, but that's a density. What is the weight in pounds of the contents in the container? Well, if it's 0.25 pounds per cubic feet or per cubic foot, I need to know how many cubic feet I have. So the first thing I do is I figure out the volume. That's gonna be 12 times 8.5 times four. All of that gives me a volume of 408 cubic feet. All right, but that's not the answer, right? It's not choice two, that's the volume. I need, now need to take those 408 cubic feet and multiply by a quarter of a pound per cubic foot. So I'm gonna take my volume, I'm gonna multiply it by 0.25 pounds per cubic foot, and that will give me 102 pounds, right? If I told you I had five dozen eggs and I asked how many eggs there would be, you'd take five and you multiplied it by 12. If I tell you I have 408 cubic feet and 0.25 pounds per cubic foot, you gotta know to multiply them. Now the last thing with density, and that's gonna be it for us, is if we actually have to calculate a density. January 2016, during an experiment, the same type of bacteria is grown in two Petri dishes. Who cares that it's the same type? Petri dish A has a diameter of 51 millimeters and has approximately 40,000 bacteria after one hour. Petri dish B has a diameter of 75 millimeters and has approximately 72,000 bacteria after one hour. Determine and state which Petri dish has the greater population density of bacteria at the end of the first hour. So population density means you're gonna take, you're gonna take the number of bacteria and you're gonna divide by the area. Because I wanna find out how many bacteria there are per square millimeter in this case. It could be how many people per square mile, it could be how many llamas per square meter. In this case, it's how many bacteria per square millimeter, which means I gotta figure out the area of both circles and then take the populations and divide them by those areas. And again, these are kind of obnoxious numbers because with this first circle, right, the area of a circle is pi r squared, they don't give me the radius, they give me the diameter. And worse yet, they make it odd. So when I divide it by two, it's kind of an annoying number. It's 25.5. So the area of the first circle is something like 2,042.8 uh, square millimeters. 
The area of the second circle, the area of circle B, also pi r squared, but this time a different r, also odd, also obnoxious, 37.5 squared gives me 4,417.8, uh, yeah, and point, yeah, actually maybe 0 0.9, 0 0.9 square millimeters, right? It's a bigger, bigger thing, okay? And now all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this bacteria and divide by that area, this bacteria and divide by that area, just to see how many bacteria are sitting in a square millimeter. So I take 40,000 and I divide by 2,000, ooh, 2,042.8, and I get 19.58 bacteria per square millimeter. Likewise, I take 72,000 and I divide by its area, 4,417.9, and I get 16 points, uh, let's see, um, 29 bacteria per square millimeter, and therefore dish A has the higher bacteria concentration. And again, it just means the bacteria are more crowded. For every square millimeter, there are about 20 bacteria in the first Petri dish and about 16 in the second. It's actually fairly close when you really think about it. Holy cow! That's it. I don't even have a final slide. I meant to put one in, you know, and blah -de blah Okay, I know we didn't hit half as much as you wanted me to, um, but I'm twice as tired as you would expect. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a long Regents exam period. I want to thank you for joining us for Common Core Geometry. We're going to have all those videos up in just a little bit. And as a bonus, you get to see probably the sound a little bit off sync with my mouth right now. It probably looks like it's some kind of, ja oh no, it's not. Okay, it just, it looks a little choppy on the screen. I mean, we could do like a kind of an anime thing. You know what I mean? Like it's been dubbed, I've been dubbed. Anyway, regardless, look, you got an exam tomorrow morning. You're going to have to think very clearly to, to, to do well on it. Remember two things. One, get a good night's sleep. Eat a good breakfast, number two, right? Remember that you have three hours on the exam and take your time. You've got all the time in the world. I know it's a lot because you've got proof. There's a thousand theorems to memorize and all that. Think clearly. Know what you know. Know what you've been given. Remember the formula sheet, especially on problems like, well, maybe not like this, but like the volume problems, and you're going to do great, okay? Trust your thinking. Get a good night's sleep, all right? Thank you for joining me for the Common Core Geometry Live Regents Review. Until I see you next time, maybe next year in Algebra 2, remember, keep thinking and keep solving problems. Good night, everybody.